This is Glambition Radio, episode number 294, Nine Lives to Live, with Paige Adams-Geller. Ladies and gentlemen. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and founder of The Trust, the modern premier network for seven and eight figure women leaders. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are creating the new models for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And hey, we're doing it with style. So let's go. Jeans are such a special thing, and they've really become such an American iconic piece of clothing that everyone owns. I don't care what age, what shape, what size, you know, pretty much everyone has some type of pair of jeans. And they're a very personal thing. And I remember growing up, you know, we really just had got way back, like what, Lee? Sears, Sears jeans, I think I had in in, uh, elementary school. And then suddenly jeans started getting a little cooler. We had our Jordache, you know, we had some different brands, guest jeans and all that. And then suddenly for me, it was like the mid 2000s is when jeans suddenly changed and they were a different fit. They kind of lifted your bum a bit. They could do different things with your body. There was different shapes and cuts and so many more options to find a pair that made you look and feel amazing. And for me, that really started with the brand Paige and those jeans. And for years, I wore her jeans. They fit the best without even knowing the woman behind the brand. And then a few years ago, I believe it was through Carrie Murphy, my friend who is now also a member in the trust, got an introduction to Paige because Paige had spoken at one of her events, which are fantastic. And I got to know the woman and the story behind this brand. And a few years ago, we had her on the show. I wanted to have her back because there's so much going on, not only with the Paige brand, which is now a lifestyle brand, not just a denim brand, but also how has she fared through the last few years? I mean, in a time of a lot of retail shutdowns, people having to make real about faces and how they do business and market and sell Uh, She shares in this interview that she actually has come out well ahead of where they were. It's an amazing story. And she has an amazing story as well, one you may not be aware of. And I was so excited that she went into much more depth on this interview about her personal journey than she did on the last show. So every show brings something special. If you want to go back and listen to that last one, it was in 2018. We will put a link to it here in the show notes. And most excitingly, Paige is going to be our guest speaker this fall for our official member meeting for the trust happening here in Scottsdale in October. She is going to spend the whole morning with us sharing more behind the scenes stories, business advice, Q&A. We don't just bring in speakers for a keynote and they jet out. They typically spend the entire morning with us and it's an intimate environment. You know, we really get to know these women. So if you or someone you know is running a business and your revenues are in the seven to eight figure range, this is the room you want to be in. It's a different conversation behind closed doors. Join the trust.org to learn more, to apply, to talk with us. That's the place, join the trust.org. And I want to give a quick plug for Iconic, my event in November. If you are not at the seven figures yet, you could still join us at Iconic. We do have a few qualifications we're looking for. It's definitely a curated room of extraordinary women, but here's what you need to do. Get on our priority notification list because we are about to open seats. You want to something extraordinary? We have already sold several dozen seats behind the scenes to my members of the trust, to some of the incredible ladies who have joined us prior. So we've been doing kind of this private pre-sale Now we're getting ready to open the doors to some ladies who have not been with us before. Maybe this is the year that you finally want to attend. Maybe you've been listening to some of these shows going, gosh, to be in a room with some of these kinds of women, it would just be life-changing. It really is. 
iconicwithallybrown.com. Just enter your info there. And then you'll be first to know when the details are ready. You can get all the info and then you decide if it's a fit for you. Iconicwithallybrown.com. Quick shout out to two great reviews that my team pulled for me from Apple Podcasts. The first is Mary Robinson Reynolds. It's a nice name. She says, I have been with you for over a decade. This sounds like song lyrics. I like this. And I love how calm your voice is and your content always makes me feel like I can do this. Keep on keeping on. One day I intend to earn my way into the trust. Thank you, Mary. And the next is Liz Rad 68 I've been following Allie for many years and I love this podcast. She's such a brilliant interviewer. I always get a few ahas and takeaways from her amazing guests. Thank you, Allie and team for keeping these great episodes coming. Thank you. Thank you for taking the few minutes it takes to leave a review, help other women find these intelligent conversations we are having on the show with a fun name, Glambition. I'm still Glambition, you know, it's still there. And now speaking of Glambition, oh, this woman fits the definition, does she not? Get ready for an extraordinary conversation with Paige Adams Geller. And If you'd like to join us in person this fall here in Scottsdale, join the trust.org. Paige, I'd like to know where you are right now. I'm actually sitting at my house in my bedroom in the Pacific Palisades in California. Ah, now you're still there. Is your office still in Culver City? Yes, it is. It's in Culver City. And then we actually also have an office in New York and an office in London. Oh my gosh. So... I'm dying to jump in and ask you all these questions. I feel like Uh this is part two to when we interviewed Uh in 2018. Can you believe it? Four years ago. And I remember talking about how amazing it is because you share the same name as my stepdaughter, Allie, because she just got married and her name's Allie Brown. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. So we got the few of us floating around, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Amazing people. Uh Gosh. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to jump in and then I think we'll backtrack after that. I'm going to jump in. How have the last few years been for you? Because when we were talking, you were, you know, opening all these retail shops, you know, you were expanding the line. And then, you know, I'm, the first thing was on my mind when we were going to reconnect is like, I really want to hear how did she navigate Paige through the last few years? Such a good question and and so important. I felt like at first it felt like the world was ending and the sky is falling and it was overwhelming and scary. And then to be honest, it's like, I love my work and I'm passionate about Paige and having the opportunity to be the creative director and the founder and give birth to something. It's something that I'm so connected to and so passionate about. And the fact that my family works with me, it felt like the most important thing to do was to continue to do what we do, be creative, take care of our team members, not furlough anyone, have daily meetings on Zoom or on phone calls to connect with the sales teams and the design teams and just keep things moving along. And I felt like that was the best thing we ever could have done. And it was the best thing for my own like mental health and for remaining connected and to do what I feel is like important for me as a person to have a creative outlet and to be able to share that. And so, you know, basically... I was living with, you know, my husband and I and my stepdaughter had moved in with us, Allie Brown. And so we had the marketing director, the the president and the creative director all under one roof. (laughs) So (laughs) we just made my bedroom, the design studio. Allie took an office downstairs and that was like her marketing office. And Michael kept talking to the sales teams and keeping us moving and grooving. And we didn't miss a beat. We figured out how to design from my bedroom and do fittings on Zooms. Um, I tried on every proto that was delivered to the house and we didn't miss a beat. And honestly, what was beautiful about it is that, you know, people were also pivoting and, and thinking that, oh no, no one's ever going to dress up again. So let's all What's of a sudden- the first thing I thought of? Like, like, was there a moment that you were like, oh my God, everyone's just going to wear sweatpants and it's over? I thought about it for a moment. And then I thought, you know what? I'm a woman and I know how women think. And after a while, we are going to be so sick of ourselves in our sweats, not taking showers and not grooming. And we're going to want to get out and get something new to make us feel good when things open up again. Mm -hmm. And I felt like there's nothing better than when you have a new outfit and you're so excited to wear it somewhere, that feeling or 
there's the sport. It's like a sporting event to go shopping and find the perfect pair of jeans. Um, and then there's special occasions that would happen again when the world opened, graduations and showers and weddings. And like, and so I felt like I don't want to stop what we're doing. Let's even design more dresses than we normally do for when the world opens back up. Let's make sure that we have flats and high heels and shoes that are comfortable to wear. I actually think I became better at designing some of the more casual parts to the collection of the brand, like helping the team with knits and like weekenders instead of just denim. Cause those were mm-hmm. the kinds of things that I wanted to wear around the house when I was on zooms mm-hmm. to be comfortable, but still look cute and polished. And like I made an effort that was really important for my mental health. So to be honest, we really didn't miss a beat. Mm. It just took longer to get things done. Did any stores close? We did have to close our stores. So that what that was tough. We had to close our stores. I mean, for a, for a while, right? I yeah. mean, did they reopen or what was, what was the yeah. situation? We closed our stores, but we didn't furlough anyone. And then what started to happen is our sales teams would make phone calls and outreach and stay connected to some of their best customers and let them know that they were there for them if there's anything they wanted or needed, kind of as personal shoppers. Mm -hmm. And then luckily when the stores opened, the beautiful part about not stopping the design process is that we had product that was fresh and new. So as soon as our stores opened back up, we had new beautiful things that were right for the season where there were a lot of other companies that stopped everything, closed everything, stopped manufacturing, stopped producing. And then all they had was old inventory to sell when things opened back up. I remember going back to Nordstrom at one point, like after things were kind of, you know, when I was finally ready to go back and shop again and they had Mm -hmm. like puffer jackets in July. And that's when I knew there was like a gap. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There was like obviously a supply gap. Like (laughs) like there was was empty spaces, you know, it just felt really weird. You know, maybe... Maybe I overestimated though how much it hit the fashion industry. Maybe it didn't hit it as much as I had uh, expected. No, it really did hit hard, but we still, I think we've, because we're a brand that, you know, when the pandemic started, we were a brand that was like 16 years young or 16 years old, whatever you want to say. I think there were people that knew the quality of page and they shopped online. So between our own websites and other online shopping experiences, they were able to continue to buy product. And there were people that literally had money to burn and they were bored. So they did a lot of online shopping. And then once the world started to open up in different places, the good news was that I think there was a fear of going to the bigger shopping malls and being around too many people and going to department mm. stores that were too big. Yeah. And so having a lot of specialty boutiques that are like, you know, a thousand, twelve hundred square feet and being able to kind of be more mindful of how many people were in the store at that time shopping made people really comfortable to go back to to shop. So I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm really not like exaggerating. And I actually cry and pinch myself that we made it through the pandemic and last year was the best year we've ever had at wow. age. Like we did the most volume we've ever done and our international sales and business, especially in London, were on fire. And so was our men's business. And so we had these loyal customers that knew what size they were in their jeans and they'd go online and buy their seven pairs of their man. You know, I need seven new pairs of jeans. I'll buy a different wash. And, you know, since people can dress a little bit more casually when going back to work in so many places with this new hybrid model, of work. Yeah. People were kind of excited that they might not have to wear suits and ties to work. And so we're buying more, more denim. And then some women were getting excited about getting dressed up again and looking forward to, to getting to the office and maybe getting away from home where there was insanity with kids. <laughs> totally. <laughs> no, it's funny because now, you know, when, I, when I, when I got this house, the, the size of it was originally to have, you know, I had dreamed of the the offices here and like renovated the living room to be like this beautiful meeting space. And now I'm like, I need to get out and put on some real pants. Like I, yeah. I, 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 Erica and I meet every you know week. Now we just get out, we get out of here at, at a beautiful office space. We want to be around people and I want to remember the clothes that I wore, you know, know, yeah. <laughs> and, get out. and it does, I do feel, di- I said, we need to do this more. I said, cause I feel different out of the house and properly dressed. And I still like the home days. Like today I'm just banging through stuff, you yeah. know, a little maxi dress thing, just like floating around the house. It's kind of hot. 
And I think, yeah, I feel like this was the year everyone kind of have settled into like the new Uh fashion and they're starting to understand, I think, what upscale casual really is and how to wear Uh that to work and look crisp. Some people have not figured it out, but we won't talk about Uh them. (laughs) Yeah, that's so true. But another thing though, I I mean, I was one of those people that for a while was like, do I have to shower today? Like, okay, I can put a hat on and get on Zoom and no one will know that I haven't washed my hair in days. Because I, I still was, even though I was working, I still had bouts of depression through 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 the last two years. But it does feel really good when you do make an effort. And I think the funniest thing that happened during this two-year pandemic that's still going on, but getting better, was that the, the skinny jean, the death of the skinny jean, it actually made people have fear that they were going to look so dorky if they were wearing skinny jeans back out into the real world that they felt like they had to go buy new jeans. So even though I always will love a skinny jean, people were like feeling like, oh God, I better get out and feel like I, I feel like I'm wearing something appropriate for the time instead of looking dated. Like I'm still wearing skinny what's, what's in now? Maybe I need a wake up call. Okay, what? Yeah. I don't wear jeans a lot here because it's so hot, but what, so tell hot. Us, give us a quick fashion insight. Sure. You know, right now it's all about wide legs and um, a lot of the Y2K trend is happening. So it's so funny to think about what was happening back, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, like very Sarah Jessica Parker, Paris Hilton, Britney Spears. So there are for the younger generations, lots of crop tops and wide legs. And for, you know, someone who's a little bit more mature that might not want to show their midriff, you know, what's really been trending are dresses and maxi dresses and midi dresses. And so that's been really fun. And then pops of fresh color. Okay. And then as we go into fall, it's all mm-hmm. about like, you know, platforms are back in. So whether it's a platform sandal or a platform boot, those look so great with like a great flare. Yeah. Like a long leg look. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm embarrassed. It, it took me a few years to even be open to a skinny jean mm-hmm. and it took me a while to settle in. And now I need to go back to wide leg. So I need to, <laughs> I need to trip into your store. Soon. Yeah, that's oh, that would be so much fun. And I can't wait to come out in October and see our store in Scottsdale, which is one of our best stores. And, you know, finally get it does there. well. It does so well. You know, it's a little it's, softer mm. when it gets really hot outside. But I think as people are aware that we do dresses and shorts and we have a lot of lighter fabrications that are like what we call the weekender category for like jogger jeans, like jogger um, mm-hmm. kind of twills and stuff like that and sandals. You know, it's it's actually a really strong door. And especially like during spring training, the the store is on fire for men and women. So it's um lovely. Spring here is crazy because they've got yeah. PGA. I think next year we have the Super Bowl or maybe it's 2024 is going to be here. So fun. I mean, there's, there's so much going on here. It's getting nuts, a little too crazy. So um, that's why I've, I've, I've avoided that area for a while because it is crazy. Yeah. Now I'm going to go shop because it'll probably be a little more easy <laughs> to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're we're so excited to have you. And I I told mm-hmm. all the women of the trust too. I said Paige is so fascinating to me because there's the Paige brand and and you honestly from a distance not knowing you that you just kind of take it face value like oh she's this you know pretty model girl who started this jean company. And then I started to learn more about your story and who you are and more of the depth behind why you do what you do. Uh I became very intrigued. And that's when I first asked for an introduction to you. And we started talking, you know, several years ago. Now I'm so excited to have you in the room. So really we have, you know, the closed doors in a room of these women who have all broken into the seven and eight figure revenues, you know, for you to share the behind the scenes really and and, on the decisions you've made and, and how you've done this. Let's give a bit of an overview of that story here for all the listeners of the show, if you don't mind, you know, talking about how and why you did start Paige. Absolutely. Um, It's definitely been a beautiful experience. And one of those that is a story of having turned lemons into lemonade. I was always intrigued with the entertainment industry. And one of the reasons why I left Alaska and came to California to go to school, to go to USC university was to be in the middle of the whole entertainment world. And I majored in broadcast journalism and thought I would actually be a talk show host and, or, you know, uh, uh, have be in the, um, entertainment field Mm -hmm. of journalism. And, but before that I had, I had gone to New York and modeled when I was 16 and had a lot of the unfortunate me too experiences. And so having left New York and going to university and really focusing on my mind, 
and thinking I was going to go a different direction. I finished college at 20 and still was young enough to get sapped back up into the entertainment world. And so I've started singing and acting and modeling. It just happens in LA, doesn't it? It just does. You know, people are like, come in, you know, you should uh, really come in for an interview at our agency and you'd be great in commercials. And so I was singing, acting, modeling, doing commercials and all of that. And unfortunately, you know, just got caught back up into the very unglamorous side of the ugly side of the business. And I hit my own personal rock bottom where I didn't feel like I was good enough. I was suffering from anorexia. I got attacked in the workplace, which led me to go to the rape treatment center to to get help. And I'd never gone to therapy and I'd never been, I'd never had a place where I could go and talk about my experiences, never had a safe haven, I guess is what I was trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to my first therapy session at the rape crisis center, the rape treatment center in Santa Monica, I really finally had to acknowledge that I had been a victim of rape or a rape survivor at the age of 16 and didn't tell anyone and had kept that secret for 13 years. Mm. And so while I was going through therapy, which was very difficult for me, it was hard for me to be out in the real world on a daily basis, going to my fit modeling jobs and modeling jobs and interviews and castings, and then go to therapy once or twice a week and then talk about all this really heavy stuff. And so my therapist suggested that I go away to a 30 day facility to deal with my eating disorder and trauma and really start kind of start to heal. I was abusing alcohol. So it was kind of like trying to figure out, you know, how to put myself back together again. And in that journey of healing, I decided that I wanted to take on my attacker. And so I got strong enough to take on my attacker and go through that whole process, which was a civil suit instead of a... Wow. It was a, it was a civil suit and other women came forward to support me. Was and, this from the New York incident? Um, it, was not, it was not in New York. It was actually here in LA. This is the LA yeah, one. Okay. But it was the LA incident. Yeah, not my yeah. rape at 16. The statute of limitations had run out on that. Right. And, and I didn't know what to do there. But at least I knew that I could help prevent other women from getting attacked or raped which some other women had been by this man in the workplace while I was modeling. And so when I took on my attacker, I I started to find my voice and get strength and start to feel more comfortable in my own skin again and feel proud of myself and my actions. And knowing that I was helping others was, was really important to me. And then that led me to finally go to a life coach and say, I need to do something greater with my life. I need to do something bigger. This has really helped me find my voice. And now I feel like I need to use my creativity for something bigger. And through our work that we did together, we really focused on my passion and purpose. And and I thought I was going to want to go back into the entertainment industry after getting healthier from anorexia. And instead, she's like, I don't think this is your first love. She's like, I think fashion is your first love. And I think you have a strong entrepreneurial business mind. I had grown up with parents that were entrepreneurs and uh, my brother's an entrepreneur. And she's like, I think you've got this entrepreneurial energy and thought process. And she's like, what if you were to start your own company, uh, your own clothing line, what would that look like? And go home and think about it and, and do some homework. And, you know, it's like, I, I didn't go to business school though. And I didn't go to design school. Like I can't imagine mm-hmm. doing that. And she's like, you've already been doing it. You've been in fashion 101 since you were 16. And aside from that, you've met so many people. You could put together a dream team of your favorite pattern makers and sewers. And she's like, just go and do the homework and let me know what you think. And then when I was ruminating on it, I thought, oh my God, this is true. Everything I'd ever done up to this point makes so much sense to me. There's clarity. Mm. It's like, I really do need to start my own clothing brand. And if I can find the right team and they jump on board and I can find the right investors, this could be amazing and magical. And I could help. Did you know it was going to be jeans at this time? Because you were Um, a fit model for a lot of jean companies, right? Yeah. I mean, at first, I think I was focused on denim because what what I would hear people say is if you were starting a brand of any sort, especially in the fashion world, to really have a strong direction and a reason to be. And so when I thought about it, even though the denim 
premium denim world was exploding in Los Angeles. And I had was working for all the denim brands that were exploding at that time, modeling and fit modeling and design consulting. I it occurred to me that there were no women that were the heads of those companies or creative directors or designers, that it was all men and they were all kind of part of this denim mafia and everybody knew each other. So all these men fitting women's butts. Like, yes. Yeah. (laughs) makes sense. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't it? They just were, you know, kind of designing what they felt we should be wearing. And they loved the denim fabrication because it's actually very exciting. All the things that you can do with denim. So when I really thought about it, I was like, this would be amazing to have a safe work environment, to be able to tell the story of what I think re- women really want to wear, create a denim line that has a little bit more of a feminine and sexy side to it, and you know, do what I love to do, you know, fit denim and create different silhouettes and really create different fits for different body types. I think I was very ahead of the game when it came to wanting inclusivity and thinking about women coming in all different shapes and sizes, but wanting to approach it from a contemporary mindset and a Mm -hmm. cool fashion mindset, not like a, not your daughter's jeans, like vibe. God, I know. (laughs) It's horrible. Uh, horrible. I remember seeing that. And first of all, I'm like, I don't want it. That brand is terrible. They're still around, aren't they? They have stores now. They must do well. I don't know. But yeah, I remember, I remember seeing, liking the idea of that, but I'm like, oh my God, these are, they're not your daughter's jeans. No way. These are mom jeans. I'm never wearing them. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, I mean, I'm not young, but like, I don't want to dress old. Like I don't want to dress mature. They so fit like thought, Lee's. Remember Lee's? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lee's, yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, I had to rant there for a minute. No, I'm thinking about that too because I like I grew up in Alaska. So then that makes me think about what people wear in Alaska. And, Lee's, uh, yeah, they wear know, Lee's, right? Lee's, yeah. <laughs> Lee's and Wranglers and Levi's. But Levi's, you know, kind of turned a corner and became cool again. But, you know, it's funny. So yeah, that was the concept, like creating a brand from a fresh female perspective to be a strong leader and entrepreneur, have a voice, be able to express myself and then, you know, have, have, have a safe haven. And, but, you know, some of the mistakes I made at the beginning were not thinking the long term. So Paige was actually called Paige Premium Denim out of the gate. Mm -hmm. And I was only thinking of denim, like, because that was something that I was an expert in at that point when we started the company and, and then realized soon thereafter that it was very difficult for a brand called Page Premium Denim to branch out into other categories because people would only see Page as a denim brand. And because I had a very swirly feminine logo because I wanted it to be more feminine, I kind of messed up in that vein with like the thoughts that, uh uh-oh, now I want to do men's jeans and they don't really probably want a swirly page with pretty feminine writing on their body. (laughs) So I needed to rethink the logo and kind of rebrand and, and, you know, take it to another level years down the line when I thought about really growing it into the lifestyle brand that I dreamed of. So we're not called Page Premium Denim anymore. You know, we're called Page, period, you know, just Page. And we're a lifestyle brand for men and women. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of learnings in there, but... I have it, questions about that, but I'm going to save them for yeah. the first meeting in October, okay. you know, about cool. branding and, and evolution yeah. and like niching versus not niching. That'll be a great discussion. Okay, cool. Cool. But, um, but it has been a dream come true and I, I love what I do and it truly was a life changing moment starting page and I've never looked back. I felt like the stars were all in alignment when I launched the brand. We got right into the you know, Neiman Marcus's, the Bergdorf Goodman's, the Selfridge, I mean, the, the, the Harvey Nichols of the world's out of the gate and little uh, specialty boutiques were lined up to come see the first launch of the collection because um, there had been a blurb in W Magazine that the fit model behind all of these um, top selling denim lines was starting her own her own denim line wow. and that uh, it, it would definitely be sure to fit well. And yeah. come from that perspective of helping women feel good about themselves and comfortable in their skin. Actually, the first little mantra that I had on um, a little credit card that was in the back pocket, it was like a faux credit card that said, I want you to love your body, feel comfortable in your skin and be comfortable in your jeans, G-E-N-E-S. And that's what I was really passionate mm-hmm. about out of the gate. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but your, your jeans were the first premium denim I ever bought. 
back. Oh. And I, th- I think I mentioned this in the show. I mean, this is so yeah. long ago, but, but I, know, I, I remember that. going from, I don't know what happened. And this will be another longer, interesting discussion, like the evolution of the gene, because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just flashing back. Like, you know, we were all like, we're in gap. And then suddenly I remember guests came out and I wanted something for my, I wanted like 50 bucks to buy guest jeans. And yeah. then, but like, you know, Jordash and stuff. I remember that. And then it got ugly and the, it's just been a mishmash. And then I don't know what I was wearing at the time, but I couldn't find anything. I think I was wearing like Banana Republic, which were kind of like, eh, like they didn't make me feel great. I'm like, well, they don't make me look big and they fit okay. But I wasn't, I wasn't like excited to put them on. Mm-hmm. And then a friend of mine said, we were, we were shopping and she said, you've got to try on page jeans. I'm like, I've never heard of these. What are they? And I looked at the price tag. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I remember, remember that first year, like suddenly, suddenly jeans were like 150 or something. And I'm like, what? And, and then I tried them on though. I'm like, I couldn't pull out my wallet fast enough because they fit so beautifully. I'd never had a pair of pants on like that, that made me look like that, you know, like that made me feel like that. And the legs looked long and the butt looked high and that just, everything just worked. And, um, you know, so I feel like you were at the, you just came in at like, part of it was the right time, I feel, because I, I saw and felt the difference none of the other brands really appealed to me. And then I heard about, you know, the, the what the, the whip stitch on the gene represented the nine lives. And now it was about, you know, how we all, we can reinvent, we can write our next chapter. There was just, there was so many great things behind the brand. And so thank you. I just like you to know, going back to 2006, you know, I, I remember trying that pair mm-hmm. of jeans on and how special that was. Well, you know, I was someone who, you know, I, I was overweight as a kid and then I went from being overweight and an overeater and stuffing my feelings to anorexia. Anorexia is always um, usually a byproduct of, of also sexual assault. And, you know, I, I dreaded shopping for swimsuits and shopping for jeans. And I, I just always felt awkward and uncomfortable. And, and so, and I do feel like a lot of the fabrics back then were very uncomfortable. They were all rigid. Yeah, And there wasn't a lot of stretch and I would starve myself to try to fit into the jeans that I would see the beautiful women in advertisement, advertisements wearing. And so I felt like when this new premium denim explosion was happening, there was so much innovation coming out of the fabrics from Italy and, and Japan. Japan was still known more for rigid, but Italy with all these beautiful stretch fabrics mm. and quality. And so someone would, that and I, you know, they would, freak out about how expensive, why is the price tag so expensive? But you're right. When you put on a premium pair of denim, for the most part, the quality, you get your cost per wear value out of it. And they really hold up for longevity. And the cost per wear value is amazing. And they're so comfortable. And there's so many things that we can do with the washes and the treatments on the denim, because the fabric is made so well that that give us more um, versatility. So Mm. it became something that I was, I, I, I like just was obsessed with. And I wanted to make sure that people felt good. So, you know, doing different rises and different leg shapes and creating different silhouettes on the body was like a, an obsession of mine and like my own sporting event. So do you notice differences in the geographic markets of what your customers are looking for, especially now that you're like in London, for example, mm-hmm. like are our customers, there looking for different types of fits or items than in the U.S. or even different regions of the U.S.? It used to be, uh, there used to be a, a bigger change in, or I guess what I'm trying to say, it used to be very different what was what was worn in Europe than what was worn here in the US. But I mm. think it was more from the buying perspective, like the buyers would buy Paige more safely here in the US and think of it as a more core brand. And the, the excitement came out of London where the buyers were always buying the coolest fashion board pieces from us in mm. denim. And they had, I think, more aggressive customers that were looking to page for fashion. So I get all excited every time I go to Europe because all of our coolest fashion forward jeans were there. And then I come home and every once in a while get a little bummed that like someone would say as a retailer, oh, we can't sell a a zipper bottom jean from page because it's like, it's just too fashion. And it'd be like a zipper at the bottom of the jean is too fashion. Mm. And it it would make me question. and And I was really struggling with, with, with why that was. And I felt like, I think because we were established and we fit so well that the mindset from a lot of the retailers was we're going to make page our core money-making brand. And then we're going to buy fashion from all these little smaller startup Mm -hmm. companies 
and then yeah. we'll see what happens. They and, wanted to sure things in this. Yeah. Time. And so it took me a while because I was, I was very afraid that we would start to look stale and boring and that the customer here would want to move on to the next thing, the next thing, the new thing, the new thing, and like look at new brands and look at Paige like, oh, you know, she's looking a little stale and boring. And so we really had to make an effort to, I would be in all the appointments with the retailers, the biggest retailers going forward and make sure that I was pushing fashion and core and basics and because I didn't want to look stale and old. So eventually, and especially as online business expanded and more people were tapped into international websites and online shopping vehicles, as well as domestic, everything kind of started to get a little bit more congruent. Mm -hmm. So, but before there was a lot of online shopping, there was, there was definitely differences. And then also now I think with the weather, you know, just depending on like super, super hot States, like you're in, you know, denim's going to slow down and and shorts and other things are going to pick up, especially white denim, Mm -hmm. um, lighter weight, wide, wider leg silhouettes are going to work well. And then in colder climates, they don't like a lot of destruction, you know, because it's cold. (laughs) You're walking down the street. Oh yeah, you're right. They don't want to be even, they they don't want the knee flap. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So there's a a lot of those things that come into fruition. And then, you know, still in colder climates in the winter, there's nothing better than having a skinny jean on your body. So skinny jeans are never going to die. They're just more of a classic and basic in your closet. But there was a time where I was like, okay, how many different ways can we, when, when people were only wearing skinny jeans, I was like, how many different ways can we reinvent skinny jeans? <laughs> right. Add the zipper, Add the zipper leg. <laughs> put a zipper, zipper on leg. the bottom, put two zippers on top. The Edgemont became my favorite favorite personal denim style of all time. The one that had the double zippers on both sides. And I wore that all the time because it felt like a cool fashion skinny. But anyway, I'm, I'm grateful. And I love that fashion's always moving in cycles because I feel like I never get bored. Like there's always something to look forward to. And there's always something that's innovative in fabrics. And there's always innovation now that I get to tell the whole story from head to toe. You no, know, literally head to toe because we do eyewear. So sunglasses Mm. to shoes, you know, and for men and women, we're not doing shoes for men yet, but I'm sure that's right around the corner. So it's really fun because now when I'm putting a collection together, I'm really thinking about every single component and how a woman's going to want versatility in her wardrobe or a man's going to want versatility in his wardrobe and um, focus on, on all of that. So it's, and it's really fun because it comes from my heart and soul. And even if something's trending and I, I wouldn't wear it now, but I would have worn it in high school, then I feel like it belongs in the collection. So I stay very true to <laughs> the perspective of the brand coming from my feminine, sexy rock and roll alter ego. And so there's always like a bohemian side to the brand that's a little bit more like maybe your Malibu girl. Mm-hmm. Um, there's always like that ethereal feminine, roughly almost, which is cool again, Barbie side of the brand, <laughs> just mm-hmm. ultra feminine. And then there's my total rock and roll alter ego. Cause I think I was a British rock star in my past life. More edgy. So there's always that edgy, like edgy Barbie or edgy girl. That's that I, that I think about, like, what am I going to wear? What, I love music so much. What am I going to wear if I'm going to a concert or what would I wear if I was the lead singer, you know, in the band. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I can't wait. I'm selfishly, you know, I'm, I'm excited you're coming to the trust meeting. Cause I just want to talk to you for two hours, but I'm, wait. I'm so excited. I mean, the members are so excited to meet you and spend time with you. And, um, well, you I know, encourage anyone that's, that's, you know, that can come in October to come. I would love the more the merrier come join us. It's going to be so much fun. And I could talk to you for hours and I could listen to your voice for hours. It's so soothing. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, To wrap up, and Mm -hmm. I don't want to wrap up, but I know we're at time. I'd love Mm -hmm. you to share three pieces of advice for all the women listening now, you know, could be based on the last few years or just, you know, just things you'd like them to know from your entire career and, and what you have created. Absolutely. I would say the first thing that's really important is to not be afraid of change. You know, change is good. And I think when you're too complacent and you're feeling like you're in your groove, that is when you make your biggest mistakes. It's like always be thirsty for knowledge, always be thirsty for more innovation and make sure that's why those nine bars are on the back of the jeans. Like don't be afraid of change, embrace it. 
And so I felt like that's what we were able to do the last two years by pivoting and not being afraid. And, and that helped us continue to kind of turn into um, a butterfly, you know, from mm-hmm. come out of the cocoon and, and spread our wings and fly. So that would be one of my first tips. And um, I think the second thing would be to value your team. You know, I really am only as good as my team. And I feel like those daily check-ins that we had the last two years brought us even closer together. And I really wanted to hear what they had to say. I wanted to know their fears, their concerns. I value their opinions. And so um, even lots of interns that I bring into the company, I want to hear what they have to say. It's like, what, what do you think? Would you wear that? What, what do you think we could do better? Like, I think it's really important to value everyone that is part of your world, your, your, your vision, like who's making things happen. So mm-hmm. for me, I, I love that. It is a page family in my eyes and um, to really get all the teams to talk to each other as well, to not stay in their own little silos yeah. and to continue to have build that culture, I think is the shoulder to shoulder culture and keep people connected. So that would be my second main tip and my, my words of learning and wisdom. And I think finally the I think the third thing I I would say would be to really always think big picture because that's where I made some of my biggest mistakes. So, you know, really allow yourself when you're putting your thought process together on, on what it is that you want to start as if you're starting a company and not lock yourself into just one specific thing, like allow yourself the vision of what it could look like 10 years down the road, you know, or you could do the five-year plan, the 10-year plan of like what your goal setting is. So, because I also think that part of what happens is manifestation. So if I'm not just living in the moment and designing in the moment and thinking in the moment, but there's a bigger picture to my brain and my thought process, I think that's when you absorb everything else that's going on around you that continues to, to, I guess, stick inside and help manifest and create the longer big term picture, if that, if that makes sense, because I feel like if, if you, sometimes if you're just stuck in your own little, in your own little world and you're not thinking big picture, uh, you can get stuck and not know how to grow the company or grow the business. Yeah. And it's always important, um, investors and, and other, uh, people that you're working with, um, like retailers are always looking for growth. So yeah. that, that growth thought process needs to be there. How are we going to grow? Yeah. I want to, I want to actually, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to add something on that. Cause I think that's so key what you just shared. And I want to add on also, you know, remind your team of that too. Cause it's interesting. Mm-hmm. We, we get sucked, you know, we start as the creative and we start as the visionary and we start, and then we get sucked in, like you said, the day to day and just dealing with the mm-hmm. stuff. And so does the team. And so yes. it's our job to, and I have to remind myself this too, but like, you know what, I need to remind them all, like, here's the plan. Here's the vision. Here's where yes. we're going. Here's how we need to think and who we need to be. And, and it's our job to do that. And so, so thank it's you. For so true. And that. I also want to add one more thing then to that, mm-hmm. because then they also see opportunity for growth within themselves, because if they feel like they're in a position and they're going to be stuck in it and that's all they're going to get to do, that's when people start to bounce, yeah. like bounce, bounce, bounce. And they leave because they think that there's no opportunity for growth. Yeah. So if they know that your vision is growth and that they can grow within that vision, they're more apt to try even harder and want to help grow the company more and not look at it as, oh, this is more work. It's like, oh, wow, I can move up the ladder and be part of this for a long time. Totally. Like the the vision has a clear plan for growth, that they have a clear plan for growth. Yes. And um, yeah, so good. Oh, I can't wait. Okay. By the way, if you're, if you're, so if you're listening, you know, if, if you're over the million dollar mark, come have a look at what we have. It's jointhetrust.org. Come learn more. Talk with my team. We'd love to have you come on as a member. You'll be able to join us in October. And Paige, no matter what, like, you know, everyone listening, I know they got tons of value from this conversation. Where should everyone follow you and learn more? Oh, follow us at page.com. And, um, I mean, my own Instagram, I'm not on that often because I'm more focused on the business, not trying to make myself an influencer, but I'm at page a Geller. If you're interested in following me on anything there, I'm trying to get back into it, but most important it's page.com. Perfect. Take care. See you soon. Thank you. You too. Big hugs. Can't wait to see you in October. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. 
If you enjoy the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get my new shows every week. Also, I'd love if you left us a review so more women like you can discover us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, and other major platforms. And I'd love to hear from you personally. Come join the conversation on social. Instagram is my happy place lately, and that's Allie Brown Official. But you can find links to my other platforms at AllieBrown.com. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you tuned in.